you notes? We've been doing our how-to series. I get excited about it. Because a lot of Christians today, they're desiring to know how to do certain things. Now, if you go to a good church, there's a lot of them around. You'll notice that some churches, some of the bigger churches, will be teaching a five-point sermon. You ever notice that? It'll be do this, do this, do this, and do this, which is great because we need points. We need talking points. We need certain things to level out. Now, I'm going to read that first paragraph, so make sure you follow along with me. But, but in that very thing, um, a lot of the times what they teach is psychology. It reasons with the mind. But how many know that the Word of God goes deeper than psychology? Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're going to teach you tonight how to really cast off the cares of life. Amen. Say amen. 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 Now, I know that all of us have experienced one way or another different cares of life. So read along the, the top of your paragraph in your notes. So in this series, we'll be giving you the insight and some how-tos in your spiritual walk. Say so, yay. As a believer, there are many wonderful Christians would enjoy, I believe, they would enjoy more abundant life if they knew just what to do and when to do it. Hello. Also, many Christians today go to church, but they go to church for the fellowship, the good music. But one of the things often, and I believe what the enemy doesn't want us to do, is to hunger after his word. Just like the picture that I showed you. If you look at it in the surface, you can see a wonderful face of Jesus looking with you or looking at you with the eyes of compassion. But if you stare into his face, like uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, now, I'm going to go back to the thing. It says, we with an open face as beholding in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the image, the same image. So you look into that image and you see more detail. Same with the word of God. So being in fellowship with God, here's our, our paragraph again, should be a normal thing for being spiritual, should be normal for us humans. After all, we were made spiritual beings. Do you agree with that? And so we're living in a very carnal, very sensual world. And being in fellowship with God, we should be our, our lifestyle today. So today, we're going to show you how to cast your care over on the Lord and walk free from the weight and the bondages of fear and worry. Everyone say amen. amen. Okay, now, you only have one author and the finisher of your faith. Yet some Christians believe circumstances is what's making and molding them. Not at all. God wants to finish your faith. Thus, it is not one hair or one little flake off your skin that falls that God's not aware of. Amen? So a lot of the burdens and the cares of this life, we are not meant to carry. So we should be able to cast them over on the Lord. So our opening text is in Matthew Chapter 6, verses 24 to 34. If you're following along in your Bible, I'll give you a little space of time to do that. Or you know I'm going to read it to you. And so to help you understand this verse, remember there are two of you. Say there's two of me. One's to be crucified and the others to live in newness of life. Now, who can tell me what part of you needs to be crucified on a daily basis? Your flesh. And why? This Bible study is open. Why would you, your flesh need to be crucified on a daily basis? It has a curse in it. It's sinful. You're, you guys are right. Right on. Danny's right on. You're right on. And sinfulness causes you to what? Sin, sin, or miss the mark, or blow it all the time, or fall short of your goals. Hello? But there's two of us. So the part that falls short that has the curse in it that Danny mentioned is our flesh, and the Bible says we were crucified with Christ. So we need to go to God every morning and lay our flesh down and ask God to help kill it and rise up in the newness of life and follow after God. 
So when we study the scripture like we're doing tonight, we should be in the spirit of things. Can you say amen? And letting God, the Holy Spirit, teach us the word of God. All right. So when it says no one can serve two masters, he's not talking about so much as money versus God as your spirit versus flesh. Okay? So put that in there as we read it. Verse 30, uh, verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot, you cannot serve God and mammon. Now, some translations render mammon out as finances. But here's what God showed me. Mammon is the means of exchange and communication. You cannot serve God and your own ability to make money and communicate carnally. You can't serve God one minute and be carnal the next. Everyone say amen. Okay, I don't want to go into too much delta. So you cannot serve. In other words, it's impossible. You're going to flip on, you're going to flip out, and you know, this is double-mindedness. Okay, verse 25. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life. So which part of you is a worrier? Your flesh. Okay? Your flesh has worry in it, and it affects your soul, doesn't it? All right. So here's the key. You have a spirit that has God in it. So next time you look at something that is saying to you, you, you better get this fixed. And you possibly can't right now do anything about it. What should you do? Give it to God. God. Cast your care over it on the Lord. Why? Because you can't do anything by worrying it, worrying or anything. Therefore, I say, which of you by worrying about your life and which of what you will eat, what you will drink, nor don't worry about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food? Someone say amen. And the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. We see them every morning. It's great. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. What are we going to eat today? Hey, let's go over the elephants. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And if you look at it the way it was meant, God's saying, hey, there's so many millions of birds out there, nothing's starving. How much more valuable are you? In other words, why aren't you just trusting that I'm going to take good care of you? Right? All right. But there's another master working in our members called our flesh that wants to prove itself, that wants to show everybody what it can do. It's not their first, I hate the term, parade. You know? They, not their first horse they've ridden. Yeah, but you keep falling off of them, you know, the idea. <clears throat> so... A lot of Christians are learning not to fluctuate from how they feel, what they see, from their spirit and following God. Eventually, it begins to even out and become stable. Can you say amen? amen? If we can get you exposed to enough of God, you'll become a stable person. And every business and every employer loves stability. Can you say amen? All right, so let's go on. So in verse 25, we read that. Look at the birds. Now look at verse 28. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, neither do they spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow it's thrown into the oven, Will he not much more clothe you of little faith? Amen, right? Therefore, do not worry, saying, do not worry, and especially talk about it. Don't, if you're worrying, don't talk. Oh, I don't know. We're not going to be able to get this, and it doesn't seem like we're going to get this. Good to see you, and we're not going to get this. Don't talk about it. 
Why? Because by talking about it, you might tip the devil off. Hello? Not, not saying you will, because he's not omnipresent. We're, we're right there on, on the notes. We're reading the scripture in Matthew, so you so can catch right, right up with us. So it says, look, therefore, do not worry. And if you worry, don't talk about it. Hello? Now, have you ever listened to people talk? Have you ever seen that some people really talk about their worries and their fears more than other people do? Well, yeah, the idea is that Jesus doesn't want us to do any of that because what that does is builds pictures in our mind. So when you hear the, like, for example, when I say dog, all of you are going to get some kind of a picture in your mind about a dog, okay? And you all have your favorite ones, you know? And if I say black dog, then it's going to narrow it down a little bit. And if I say black Labrador dog, then you're going to see Labrador dog. Well, that's what the Word of God does. If we look at it and look for the details in it, it will describe the issue in detail. If we're just going to surfacely look at the, the thing, we still can get some meaning. We're, we're not going to get the color of it. We're not going to get the depth, Danny, of it. We're not going to get it in 3D the way the Holy Spirit can give it to us. But if we would just realize that when we read Scripture, when we serve God, we do it from our heart. So God can give us as much detail as we need for our personal walk. Someone say amen. amen. Okay, we're in verse 31 again. Verse 31 in Matthew, our first scripture chapter. Okay, so it says, verse 31, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things, now this is a very important part of the scripture. After all these things, the who? The Gentiles seek. Okay, Gentile back in the scripture meant the people that weren't Jewish. You were either Jewish or you were Gentile, okay? And the idea is you either had a covenant with God or you were one of those strangers. Now, God knows no difference. There's neither Jew, Gentile, male, female, bonds, servant, black or white. As far as God's concerned, if you love me, I love you the same. That's what that means, okay? Not to get into detail. So when God looks at a woman, he doesn't say, I treat the women less than a man. No, there's neither male nor female. So we look at this scripture now, and it says, after these things, the people that know not God seek after. The people of the world want to have clothing to wear. They want to have a good job to pay their bills, Right? But God says, don't seek after those things. Now, the key word there is seek. Everyone say seek. Because it means to desire after, to worship, almost to worship after it. I mean, it's like some people, you know, they'll get gold fever and they'll run after gold, right? And then some people that are hung up on certain things, they'll need that so bad that they're willing to seek after it and do some crazy things. So it's Jesus actually saying that the people that don't know God or don't have any experience with God are trying to get their needs met themselves. And they find themselves are serving two masters or double-minded. Yeah, Dan, Danny, go ahead. Yeah. And, and like you say, our desires... Our desires for certain things can be blinding. How many of you saw something that was pretty, the color was great, but you know, when you got it, it wasn't all that good? Oh, yeah, we've all experienced that. Well, what Jesus is trying to do is tell his disciples, don't fall after this. Don't go for trying to serve two masters because you can't. He says you'll either be loyal to one or you'll hate the other or you'll end up turning on yourself and hating yourself because you went and did dumb things, you know? Well, let's move on past that. So again, verse 32 says, For after these things the people who know not God, the Gentiles, seek. For your heavenly Father knows the things that you have need of. But then he says, this is what I want you to do. So this is a message to us right here. But seek first the kingdom of God. What do we to seek first? 
Okay, so we have to break down. We know what the word seek means. It means to go after, crave after. But then it says crave after, instead of the clothing and all, the kingdom. So we got to find out what kingdom means. I, I defined it in your notes. But kingdom means power, dominion, and influence. God's power, God's dominion, and God's influence in your life. Instead of looking for clothes, looking for a better job, go after God's influence in your life. Why? Because the things that you have need of will then be added unto you. In other words, you don't have to leave God to go after money. Or you don't have to leave your faithfulness to whatever, to what you believe in your walk with God, to try to go after it. It's like how many sorrows and heartaches have we all, we all have suffered, you know, God forbid, by, by going after something, you thought it was it, and you didn't pray about it. So not to go into detail, but we could all have an owie that we could probably dig up, but we're not going to do that. Basically, what we want to do is take the advice of Jesus, ask the Holy Spirit to help us to walk through this so that we learn to seek first the dominion, the power, and the influence of God and his righteousness. Now, let's look at that. His righteousness. Notice it's not being right with God. A lot of times people would read his righteousness. So, oh Lord, I want to be able to live like you, Jesus, to be righteous like you. Is that correct? What's missing in that equation? Can you be righteous on your own? No. That's what's missing in that equation. That's the only thing that's missing. Because Jesus became sin for us, didn't he? So he could give us his righteousness. So everyone say, I have Jesus in my heart. And because of him, I am righteous. I'm not righteous in myself. But I'm righteous in Jesus. So see, that's why the Bible says that you don't have to worry about living up to God's standard. All you have to do is turn yourself over and say, God, I can't live up to the standard here. I need your help. And God says, here we are. Yoke up with me and we'll walk, right, walk you right through it. Much better to do it that way. It's better to take a guide that's been there before than to wander through life on your own. Hello, and who's been there before? Almighty God, folks. So hook up with the guide. Holy Spirit, hook up with Jesus and let him teach you the ways of the Spirit. So Jesus says, and his righteousness. Seek for his righteousness. Seek to get Jesus in your heart. You will be righteous. And all the other things that you have need of, will be added unto you. So there's a fine line. And this is, this, we're in Bible study. There's a fine line. Because there's a part of us that says, God's not coming through fast enough. I better get out there and do it myself. There's a part of us that does it. Not all of it. We're not, I'm not talking to you. But then there's, then there's a part of us that, that say, okay, well, God, I guess I'm going to step back and trust you, but what do you want me to do? Because he might ask you to get him, he might ask you to just put out some applications if you're looking for a job. Or if you're looking for a husband, God's going to say, kick back and I'll bring him to you. <laughs> or a wife, or a wife. Folks, listen, I went out and tried to find my own. Doesn't work that way. Okay, it, you want it to, but see, there's that part. I want to look so good, you'll look so good, you'll spend extra money you don't have to look good when God could have provided that to you from free. Hello? And we've all experienced things like that. So the message is really simple. So in Bible study, the whole purpose of me giving you things that you understand is so that you can teach this too. So Marvin can teach his, his neighbors what it means not to serve two masters. So Amanda can say, hey, listen, this is what I learned last night in Bible study. 
Uh, I learned that there's a part of me that wants to do it all myself. Yet there's a part of me, God inside of me, and you can have that too. Would you pray this prayer with me? You see? And so we can share the mighty testimony of what God's doing in our life. Or we can try to go after it ourselves. I had a guy tell me this. Man, do you like the car God provided for me? And I said, man, I really, that's a Mercedes. Well, look what God provided for me. And then the, God says, yeah, ask him how much the payments are. And, and, and I said, well, how much are the payments? So when I hear God provided it for me, it means nothing down, nothing later. Okay, so don't use those words. It's deceiving. See, God helped me get this. And how's the payments? Well, they're a little high, but God helped me make the payments. It's great. And then I asked him, have you thought of the insurance? <gasps> no. It's amazing. God gave you a car and he didn't tell you anything about it. Hello? But when God does give you a car, he's nothing down, nothing later if it's an all God giving car. Otherwise, please use the right verbiage. Yeah, God allowed me to be able to get this and I'm very thankful. You see the difference? Why? Because that's a righteous way of saying it. Instead of trying to, what I call evangelize. You had a meeting, there was 27 people there, and you said, oh yeah, there was all but 50 more. Evangelizing, you know, escopatoring, making it a little larger. So, what Jesus is saying, rather than guys, he's talking to his disciples and us, rather than going out and make something out of your life on your own, how about bringing me along and seeking after what I want for you, because I have your best interest in mind. Listen, I'd rather have God guide my steps and get his benefits than me trying to go over there and get one and it breaks in two weeks. Moving right past this. But the important part, what Jesus is saying, seek first, being right with me, having Jesus in your heart, you're already right, and his kingdom, right? Why? Because I want God's dominion in my life. I don't want Carrie's crabbiness. I want God's favor in my life, not my wittiness. You know what I mean? Amen. And I want his ability to live big in me, so I'm going to have to learn to step back a little and let the Lord take me by the hand and walk me through things. Now, that takes humility. How many has ever had children that when you're trying to explain something to them, they say, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Don't be an adult that doesn't know, but you keep telling everybody you do. Moving right along. Let's look at some thoughts and points after this. Okay. Having two masters causes what we call double-mindedness. What did James say about it? James says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. In other words, when you want to go do something, you, you don't have the stability to, to see it through. It seems like something comes by, kicks out the little energy out of that. So to avoid that, God has to be first, okay? And so we, and you'll, and in, in order for God to really become first, you're going to have to need God's help. So come on, let's, let's realize, oh, yes, I put God first, and immediately the devil tries to make you a liar. So you go, Lord, I put you first with your help, of course. You see how that is better? Because when Satan starts to kick, God kicks him. See, when God's out, let's see if I can say this right. When God's out in front of us, when we promote him in front of us and not ourselves, Satan can't get to us. But when we promote ourselves a little bit, how do we go about doing that? We start talking about all the good things that we're doing and not including God in on the subject matter. We don't mean anything by that. We find ourselves more open. How many know you have an umbrella? What's the umbrella for? To cover you under a deluge of rain, right? Okay, just keep it simple. What happens if you put the umbrella down in a deluge of rain? You're going to get wet. Well, God has an umbrella of grace over the top of us. But we still run out from underneath the umbrella period. Don't get under condemnation about it. You're learning about yourself. You need to know where your weaknesses are where your strengths are, and in the weaknesses, ask for help. 
on your strengths. Ask for support. Don't begin, what is the Bible warning? It warns us, it says, be careful that you don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. Remember, what's that in Romans? Don't think a little too high of yourself. Be humble. God says, if you will be humble, I will make you something. If you will take the initiative of yourself to make you something, right in front of everybody, the word will humble you. Because to make yourself something means that God wasn't involved. And if God wasn't involved, then you are making self something and you're glorifying unbeknownst. Self. And Satan loves that because he knows how to deal with us, doesn't he? Not to glorify the devil, but he knows every little weakness we have, doesn't he? So to get those weaknesses covered, we go to God and we walk with God. So when the devil says, oh, hey, you got a weakness, says, that's all you can do is point at it, pal. Because God's got this. Amen. And that's how we need to begin to think. It takes a while to think like that. Because immediately we want to go, oh, I blew it again. I did something wrong. And get under guilt. No. 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 There's therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. You're in Christ Jesus. Yeah, but I made a mistake. So God knew that when he came to die for us. So he bought you lock, stock, and mistakes. Amen. He says, now I'm going to work with you. So that's why it's very important to get you into the word. In fact, Joe, you want to read scripture tonight? James 1.21. Good to write it down because it really basically, Joe's going to read it, basically says you need the word and, and it tells you why right there. Not to get us under a bondage, but we need to get the word in us because you can switch to your opinion or what you think about the word real easily and not mean to, and you'll miss the word. James 1, 21. You got it? Nice and loud, Jill. Superfluity of naughtiness. It's in King James. <laughs> Keep going. Of naughty, naughtiness. And receive what with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Now drop down to verse 23. 23. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. Right. So what happens is, if we look in the mirror, remember when we look in the mirror, ladies, you, you pretty yourself up. My wife's so pretty. And so she's putting on the makeup and everything, right? Okay. And then when you get away from the mirror, you don't know if your makeup's running or whatever. You can only guess, right? Well, God wants us to look at the word so that we're not running like a person that looks at their natural self and forgets that their makeup is smeared. Instead, we look at the word of God, which never changes. And we can always go to it because it's going to say the same thing yesterday, today, and forever. So we don't look at our natural man in the mirror. We look at the word of God. All right? And so the rest of that scripture says, way down at the bottom, that God brings us forth by his word. What does that mean? He brings us forth. Well, when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, he came into our spirit, didn't he? He came into our heart. So he's the word, isn't he? Yes. So when we study the word together or study the word on your own, the word releases our soul and it brings forth Christ. So as you read the word of God, it literally opens up and lets God out. Because your soul blocks him. How many has ever intended to do something, but your mind talked you out of it? Or how, how many has done this? You intended to do something, and your mind got preoccupied, and you just forgot all about it. Yet it was right on the inside of you to do that. So that means we need to take our soul and put it into the word of God and let God's word wash it so that when we do something, we're able to let our spirit lead and command because in our spirit, God lives. 
So literally what happens is there's no blockage. We're not preoccupied. We're not thinking of negativity or I, I don't want to share the word. I don't know how and talk herself out of something. Instead, the word washes our minds. So when God wants to move, you're, you're not going to block him. You just come right out and flow. And that's what we want to do. So that's why we study the word to break down the blockages and to wash our soul and exercise it so it doesn't resist God when we need to yield to him. Everyone say amen. amen. And so to do that, it just takes a period of time. It doesn't happen overnight, but you get exercise. How many here know that when you're injured, you have to learn to do certain things? Like when I first broke my arm years ago when I was a kid, I didn't lose my muscle. I lost the tone of my muscle. Do you understand? So I had to read, learn to train on bending and certain things with my mom. That's what happens when Christians back away from the word. They don't lose Jesus. They get out of tune. And when we get out of tune, when God needs to call on us, we're kind of cabluberated instead of being able to know. So the idea is we got to get you into the word enough so that it keeps your soul in a receptive mode so that God is able to work through you to the degree you understand God to work through you. So therefore, if you're not in the word, immediately your mind will switch to the old ways of thinking. It doesn't do it to be mean. It just, that's the only thing it does. And it doesn't have anything new to operate on. So we got to take out the old programming, the world, the way we used to think about things, and replace it with the word so that when something does arise, we respond in the word and we stop reacting in the flesh. All right, say I got it. All right, so we need to realize, number two, that God placed in us what we need in order to prosper and to be well taken care of, all we need to do is trust him. How many here is finding out now that you've been with the Lord? It's a lot easier instead of trying to believe for things, it's you just settle into more of a trust. Amen. It's better, isn't it? Jesus said, we're going to the other side. And yet the disciples were all irritated, you know, and God says, where's your faith? You know, the idea is if we have Jesus on the inside and we're aware that we're aware that we're aware God's inside of us, there's nothing from the outside can destroy your walk with him. God says there's nothing that can pluck you out of God's hands. The only thing you need to be careful of is you fleshing it out for any length of time. And it's okay to make mistakes. But don't have a week of it. <laughs> you know, I used to go out on benches. After the week, it took me like a month to recover. Now, we know that's the world way of explaining, but Christians go on benches. They go off on things, so we need enough word to keep our thinking balanced. Can you say amen? And we need that time with God. And again, let me encourage you. Meeting with God is really it. You have a personal physician not only lives in you, if you will meet with him on a daily basis, he will keep you healthy, spirit, soul, and body. So third thing I want to bring up, that God dwells in us. And how does he dwell in it? Does he in control? Have we put him preeminently first in our life? If not... Lord, teach us how to do that. Each one of us teach us how in our life we can keep God in the first area and not be under condemnation. Everyone say amen to that prayer. Fourthly, in your notes, fourthly, to worry and to be overly concerned about your life is a trick of the enemy. God didn't bring you this far just to leave you and have you die. Come on. But that's what the enemy tries to get us to think. You've blown it now. God's mad at you. You'll never be able to get back to where you want. I was told by ministers. See, I'm a recovered minister. Okay? I've been restored because I had it with the 
church of Jesus Christ. It wasn't Jesus that I was mad at, but I was mad at all the phonies, you know? And I thought I could justify it. I was completely wrong. But you know, I never left God. But you know, when you're not supposed to be where you're supposed to be, you don't need anybody to tell you, say, you're not supposed to be there. <laughs> you know. Anyway, so God loves us despite ourselves and says, please let me work in you. Please let me help you. Please, please let me help. He doesn't say please. I mean, because that's just his compassion. He says, come on, I want to help you. I want to help you. And we're going, but I'm suffering. Don't you see I'm suffering, Jesus? But I want to help you, but, I wanna, but I'm suffering sitting here. I get more attention doing this. You know, hello. And sometimes that happens. So, you know, I'm meddling just a little bit. But the idea is the enemy doesn't care. He wants you over on the flesh end of things. Because you're not going to be able to respond. You're going to react a lot. And boy, I tell you what, if you were given medicine, and we've probably all experienced this, God forbid, and you had a reaction to the medicine, is that a good thing? No, you want to respond to the medicine. So the, the word of God is the same way. Some people read it and they react because it convicts them of their sin. And they don't know what to do. Relax. God already knows. He already knows your condition. Now go to him about it. But so God wants us to respond and not be reactants. Can you say amen? You know what happens when you get somebody who comes into a church and reacts? Stirs the water nobody can receive. They stir up all the problems and everything. And half of them are not there, you know. The problems aren't there. They just stir them up. All right, so fifthly, finally, yes, we are to work hard, stay close to God, but trust him. If he's launched you out on your life's journey, he's going to see that you finish your race. Can you say amen? He's not going to leave you nor forsake you. He's not going to be disappointed in you. He doesn't think that way. These are the ways that the world has handed us. If you blow it, then you should be punished. Well, God already took our punishment. His name was Jesus upon the cross. So all the punishment that you and I deserved, he took. So when we blow it, we're not going to be given punishment. We're going to be given correction instead. Hello? God doesn't open up the ground and swallow you in the New Testament. He opens up his word and says, here, look at it again. Now I'll help you to do it. That's how God corrects us. If not, I'm going to do some teaching on the chastening of the Lord because it, there's a, it's really mistaught in the body of Christ. The chastening of the Lord is like a loving father that gives you a tongue lashing. He doesn't beat you with a car accident. He doesn't wipe out your hip. That's not God. That's the enemy or something we didn't listen to. It doesn't matter. God's in the fixing business. How far you fall down, he's still going to fix you. So let's stop falling down. Let's have him help us not to fall down so much. But it says even if the righteous person falls seven times, yeah, even eight times, the Lord will help him up. Why? Because you're his child. Not going to have the wolves eat you. Can you say amen? But see, our whole way of thinking thinks that way. All right, let's go on. My next point is the snare, okay, of too much care, worry, and anxiety. The snare of too much care. I like that phrase. Okay, let's go to Mark 4 in your notes. If you've got a Bible and follow along, I'm going to know that I'm going to read it also to you. Mark 4, look at verse 10 through 20. Now, this is the parable of the sower. And the disciples wanted to know what Jesus was referring to. So, there's a couple of things i like you to notice. that There's teaching that God gives to his children no one else could get. Did you know that? Yeah, the word mystery. Everyone say mystery. mystery. How many has ever been in a little club maybe when you were a kid? Maybe join the, the, the school club or what is it, the book of the week club or something like that. And then to join the club, you had to have the secret words 
or the secret handshake. How many remember something like that? Come on. At least relate to me. Just kind of shake your head. Yeah, I remember something like that. Well, how many here know about like uh, Mason, the Masons? How about the Odd Fellows? Some of those, okay? Those are secret societies. Now, the point I'm trying to make is, in order to join that society, you had to know the secrets, okay? They were called mysteries. Hello? So, guess what? God has hidden things from the wise, but revealed them to babes. That's the scripture I just quoted to you. So the way the kingdom of God and the spirit of God is set up is you have to be initiated and have the mark of initiation to get the mystery teachings from God. Hello? So the, the answer to that funny thing I just said is the, the mystery initiation is when you got saved. When you got born again, you were initiated into God's kingdom. So now it's been given to us to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to people that are outside, it is not given. So you are a privileged group because you're children of God. So God has teachings that are specifically designed for you in his word, by his spirit, that will minister to your walk. That's why you can't just generally read the word of God. God has to make it and reveal his mysteries to you. Paul said this. He said, I was chosen out of season and God revealed to me the mysteries of the kingdom of God to complete the word of God. Amen. God gave and revealed things to me that no other person had other than himself. Well, listen, I'm going to say this to you. When you go after the word of God with that attitude to want to understand and let God show you the mysteries. He'll reveal things to you that have to do with your personal walk. They're so right on, you'll never forget them. These are the mysteries that have been hidden from the beginning, but are revealed to us by his spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Okay, so let's look at this scripture. Mark 4. And when he was alone... Those around, around him and the twelve asked him about the parable, the parable of the sower. And he said to them, to you it has been given to know the mysteries. Now you know what that word means. It's been given to you because God wants you to know the kingdom mysteries. Okay? Say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. But to those who are outside, all things come to them in parables. So that seeing... They see and do not perceive. And hearing, they hear and do not understand. Lest they should turn from their wicked ways and their sins be forgiven. Verse 13 says, And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? And how then will you understand all the parables? There's the key right here. So the, the sower sows the word. And these are the ones by the wayside, where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes the word that was sown in their hearts. So baby Christian comes in here, you hear a good sermon, you go, wow! But because they have a wayside attitude. Everyone say wayside. wayside. What's that, Pastor Gary? A wayside attitude is... You could take it or leave it. You're just here. Hello. So when you hear the word, you go, oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. But immediately, when you leave the presence of that word, who comes immediately to you? Satan does. Why? He wants to steal the word. Why would he want to do that? Because the word will produce God results in your heart. And if you paid any bit of attention to it, it will produce godliness in your heart. So Satan comes immediately and pecks the seed of the word out of you. Hello. I remember the first time I went to a good meeting. I was amazed. God did miracles and everything. But I never got born again. So I went. And so when I left, I went back home to tell, at that time, my girlfriend. 
okay, not, not Linda, but my girlfriend. And she says, well, how'd the meeting go? She said, they're all crazy up there. The devil had lied to me at the time I left the meeting all the way down to tell me that they were all crazy. But they were telling testimonies what Jesus was doing in their lives. But Satan came immediately to steal that word out of my heart. So I ended up with the flu for a, for a week, sick to death, because I had blamed the things of God and called them the things of the devil. What is blasphemy? To, to say the work of God is a work of the devil. <laughs> so what I did is invited the devil to sit on my chest for a week. Hello, by being ignorant. But I wasn't saved. Didn't know any better. But see, that's what happens. Somebody new comes to church. Or you vote immediately. How'd you like? Oh, everything's great. Man, if you don't keep praying for them, it, it won't take long for the enemy to try to sow some kind of lie. Hello? So he comes immediately to take away the word that's sown in their hearts. All right, so listen to this. So, and these are the ones that are sown on stony ground, hard ground, who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. Oh, man, that was a good word, pastor. And they all have no root in themselves, no desire to study after the word, and so endure for only a time. And after that, when money shows up, we never see you again. Oh, sorry. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake. See, Satan says, man, I got to get some confusion in there because the word's going to work. And, and, and immediately they stumble. Now, these are the ones that are sown among the thorns. Here's the third set. They're the ones that hear the word and the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires or lusts of other things entering into their heart choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. And these are the ones on good ground who hear the word, accept it, and bear witness, bear fruit, some 30 fold, some 60, some 100. It's the condition of how you hear the word. So you could go one week and hear the word and receive it on good ground and go the next word and you're preoccupied with a problem or situation, a care. So you, you go, oh, that was a good word, but you didn't pay any attention to it. So immediately Satan drops those cares in on you again, starts to get you worry about it, and immediately starts choking the word, and it becomes unfruitful. What if you go? Now listen, this is what I believe, my wife believes this too. Usually the service you miss is the one that you need. And you go, well, that's kind of big of you to say. No, I'm saying, usually the way the devil works is he keeps you away from or sleep through something you really need to hear. Well, how does he know to do that? Well, he reads my notes. Don't you think the devil reads my notes and knows what I'm going to preach? Yeah, so what he'll do is, oh, oh we want to keep blankety-blank away from church today. So so-and-so will call, and they have a great need. Well, listen, Martha, meeting everybody's needs isn't going to keep you from sitting at the, will keep you, excuse me, from sitting at the feet of Jesus, which is what you really need so that you can actually help somebody. Hello? Listen, my heart goes out to people in need, but you are not Jesus so the first thing that Mary did was sit at the feet of Jesus because she knew she could get to the dishes later. Hello? But Martha, all the dishes have to be done because the king is coming. So again, prioritizing. So these are little lessons that Jesus has given us. So we want to be good ground. How do we become good ground every Sunday for church? Prayer. Pray, prepare my heart for the word. Give Pastor Kerry exactly what I need to hear. Fill his mouth with good things, Lord. And let the music minister in my heart. So you just pray for the service a weeks in advance. But no, no. We stumble in on our Saturday. We don't realize that the enemy says, okay, now usually you got all the prayers right and everything on a Sunday. But on Saturday nights, then late, the problems start. 
can't get enough rest, can't fall asleep, so-and-so relative calls you, he's going to hit you on a Saturday night. And so you're no condition for Sunday morning. Come on, folks. He's been working on human beings for 6,000 plus years. Don't you think he's got your number how to work you? He knows how to grind your grinder. So let's be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. On a Saturday night, I don't book anything on a Saturday night. People can come over and visit, but I don't book anything on it because I don't want to be taxed. I'm going to have to deliver the word of God. And that's a heavy responsibility. But you know what's more of a responsibility than me delivering the word of God? Because you have two ears hearing the word of God. You have to position yourself to hear it. Now, here's another thing that happens. Because we're learning to cast our cares over on the Lord. The Holy Spirit monitors you during the service. Is your brain shut off? No, I'm not talking about now. But you'll see people nodding. They don't mean to. But because if you go back and you interview them, what happened the Saturday night before is the enemy played with them all day long. They ate too much. They, here's one. Ate too much fruit. And now they're running. <laughs> Not thinking. So even good things can be done too much and be caused to keep you from the word of God. Remember, the Word of God is how God grows you up. So if you're not in the Word of God, you're going to always stay the same. You'll never be able to overcome. Why? Because it takes the Word of God in you to get you to overcome. Human reasoning and the way you used to think, the way I used to think, is not going to make us quit smoking, quit drinking, quit ever whatever it is, quit overeating, because there's no Word in it you got to get out of the reasoning realm and into the word realm and come out of your spirit. Who's the deliverer? You or Jesus? So you have to learn to turn him loose. And the way we turn God loose in our situations is through the word. God, I need a word on... I used to... No, I'm going to tell on myself. I used to have an anger problem. Things would get me irritated. Now, I wasn't a terrible person. I've never hit a woman or, or slam my fist through the wall or anything dumb like that. But I would get angry and have little fits. And you, how many know that's real spiritual? I'm talking years ago. So I asked the Lord, you know what I did? I asked the Lord, Lord, I need to be delivered of this. And he says, well, what I need from you, Carrie, God needs something from me. What? What is it, God? I need you to get in the word about it. Find what the word says about it about anger and all that. Find out what the word says about it so that I have something to work in you to pull you out of it. Hello. Because I can't re reason with you, Carrie, because you already know what you're doing is wrong. So reasoning is not going to do it. I mean, no, that doesn't work. You have to go after the word, find out what the word says so he, he can get it in you and he can make you an overcomer so you don't go back into that habit. I'm, say amen, somebody. Amen. This is good stuff. I'm trying to give you my best stuff here. Okay, so now. So, a couple of points. Number one, the enemy comes immediately to steal any good word you might have. So listen, if you punch the devil's lights out, you had a good service, watch for a counterattack. After you got in a good slug and you got some good stuff, and you're kicking on back on your ease, that's usually when the enemy attacks. Yeah. So, so how do you deal with that? Well, easy. Don't carry in your ease any cares, any worries, and don't stick your head out from the umbrella and go neener, 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 because the devil will kick your lights out because yeah. you're acting in the flesh about your victory in the spirit. I see people get up there, oh, I want to thank God, and they're there to start bragging about all this and all the things they're doing for God and everything, and you hardly hear anything about what the Lord's doing in it. And immediately, I see them a week later, and it's like they've been dragged through a knock hole backwards. Why? Because there was so much of them out beyond Jesus 
that Jesus couldn't cover it. Had a guy one time, two guys went to church a long time ago. One was in leadership. The other was just needing help. And they both went to the VA. And so they both showed up on the same day. And so the one went in and bragged how he was doing this and helping this guy's life. And the other said, I don't hardly know the man. Hello. So make sure that you're bringing God out. It says, hey, everything in my life has to do with God. I didn't do that. So even my underwear God provided. My shoes. Everything. Everything. Every little thing. Anything that I got a victory, I want to make sure I give God glory for that. That's the way you do it. I remember one time doing that. I know you know it. I'm almost done with you. As I went up in, God guided me to go to a place and just share what God was doing in my life. Literally, the two people that were there were shaken by that because God loves to be glorified. He loves to be, if you're going to brag, brag on him. But don't brag on what he's doing in your life like you're special because of it. Hello, you see, you see the difference? Okay, let's move right past this. Now, uh, second, have roots, stability when you study. Remember, Jesus doesn't change, so if you're vacillating in your Christian walk, you need to get and see God more, okay? Don't get under condemnation. Listen, one of the things I commit my wife and I, please, if you have a relative, you have a friend, and they're not all cleaned up yet, and they have some habits and stuff, bring them. Because we're not going to attack anybody for anything here. We're going to give you the word. And they're going to hear hope, and they're going to hear about how they can be delivered. So please invite them. Come. Nobody's going to pick on your faults. You don't have to, even if you sit in the last pew, and you're scared that somebody is going to, maybe you had a bad experience. No, here, we're going to give you the word. We're going to encourage you. We're going to pray with you. And so I truly expect people coming in for help. You know? And maybe they come in as a drunk and they leave as a saint. You understand? So, and remember where we came from. So let's move on past this. Fourthly, remember, the word sown in our heart builds the kingdom and the power and the dominion and the influence in our heart. So Satan works hard to keep you out of the word. Oh, don't read your Bible. Go ahead and just follow through on your internet. It doesn't take the place of writing in your Bible. I believe that you can go through, I look at a lot of biblical things online, and that's great. And if you have your Bible on that line, that's great. But there's something about being able to underline things in your Bible. That's what I'm saying. I'm not picking on anything. Get it, the word in you any way you can get the word in you. But, you know, I find when I sit down with the word and ask God to sit down with me, I get a lot more out of it than skimming through articles. And there's nothing wrong with skimming through articles. I watch, I watch certain news things and, and clips and stuff. Okay, so let's go down. Our last scripture for the night, I think. Let me check. No, 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 not really. But how many know? So we're going to talk about casting your care over the Lord. We might break it off because of the time tonight on this. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 through 9. Okay, and then we're going to look at uh, Job 3 and, and Proverbs 1 real quickly. I'll just read it to you. And we'll break it off there, okay? Now you have more scriptures I would like you to read at home, okay? Because there are more scriptures. There's uh, Philippians 4. Okay, and 2 Corinthians 4 and Matthew 11, okay? You can look them up on your own. They're all self-explained. But tonight we're going to look at this one as our last scripture because it is 741. Okay, so 1 Peter chapter 5, look at this. Likewise, you younger. Well, we have some elders here. So let's see, I'm 66. So I'm, I'm younger to some people and others are younger to me. So look what it says, for you younger ones, submit to the elders. Now, why would we do something like that? I don't know about you, but there were people in my life that really lived on the planet, and they had a lot of neat things to tell me. 
It was my grandfather's one. I had a sixth grade teacher named Mr. Diamond. And when he opened up his mouth, it just, you just saw it in pictures. You know, those, those private things that are special. So younger people really need to find themselves somebody that's an older example and learn to submit to them. Not some kind of yehu, you know what I mean? Okay, so likewise you younger people, submit yourselves to the elders. Yes, all of you be submissive one to another. See, we're the body of Christ. Uh, be clothed with humility. For God resists the what? Okay, so anything you do in the flesh is done in pride without God's help. So everything you do in the flesh, not nice things, but for self things, doing for selfishness, is all pride. So that's why it says that when we do things for ourselves and for the wrong reason, it's wood, hay, and stubble. What happens to wood, hay, and stubble? It gets burned up. So anything that we do in our flesh is going to get burned up. So the idea behind that is don't stay in the flesh. Can you say amen? Amen. All right. Good message, huh? All right. So don't stay in the flesh because you're not going to get... If you're weak in the flesh, if you've got a whole week, seven days, that whole week's lost. Stop. Say, God, I'm sorry. Get started on some gold, silver, and precious stone. You either serve God from your heart and, and score high, or you serve God from your flesh and you fall down. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like to skin my knee, all right? So, or break my hip or break my arm or any of that stuff. So let's move right on and listen to this, okay? You younger, submit to the elders. Yes, all of you be submissive one to another. Be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, gives grace, favor to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves. Who does the humbling? We do. You humble yourself, and God will exalt you. You exalt yourself, and God will humble you. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all of your care upon what? Okay, and then it says something strange. For he cares for you. Be sober. Be vigilant watchful, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, those fleshly Christians, okay? Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings happen to every Christian. Sufferings are experienced by your brethren in the world. So we all go through temptations. We all go through struggles. But what Jesus is saying, don't carry any worries around with you. Don't carry any cares. Don't be anxious because you're not designed to carry it. Now, what did Jesus do? In Isaiah 53, it says that he agonized. He cared. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity, and the chastisement of our peace was laid upon him, and with his bruises or stripes, we are healed. We are all like sheep. We have gone astray, but here he has become the shepherd and the bishop of our souls. So we go to him, and he begins to shepherd us. He begins to cause us not to want, not to have anxieties or worries. Why? Because he leadeth besides still waters, and green pastures. He restores our soul, Psalms 23, okay? So we look at that and we go, whoa. So when we start worrying, listen to me, when we start fretting about things and then we start talking about it, it's like hooking extra weight to you, all right? How many ever been around dogs that are really vicious and hungry? Well, the last thing you want strapped around your neck, some steak, that's what happens when we walk in the flesh. You're strapping steak on you. And right in the middle of hungry dogs and lions. He walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he made it. See, he's not a roaring lion. But he walks around like one. He's strutting his stuff, looking for somebody full of himself, bragging, and won't get rid of their cares and throw them on Jesus. So they become easy meat for, for Satan to devour. So in order to be humble, we take all of our cares and we cast them over on the Lord so when the enemy comes, 
He will find nothing to get a hold of in your life. Because you meet with God on a regular basis, daily. You walk with Jesus. How many here has been eaten or have found anybody has been eaten by a lion or attacked by a bear walking with an army of people? No, usually not two people never attacked. It's real rare. So here he's as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So the only ones that he can are the ones carrying around the worry and the anxieties and the care and talking about it. Well, we got to pray. See, that's okay that we got to pray. But what happens is people are not careful. They talk all day long their problems, their worries, their anxieties. And it's like a big sign, come and get me. Come and get, get rip me apart. Because I'm not humble, am I? I'm walking around thinking I'm better than Jesus because he carried away my sorrows and my worries. Why am I carrying them? Because you think it's your responsibility to deal with your worries. And it's not. Because it'll kill us. How many know that worrying will actually affect your health? We know that's scientific. So anyway, to wrap it up, so what do we do? How do I go about casting my care on the Lord? Well, let's, let's imagine this is your care. Usually people carry their care around, right? So I'm, if you can close your eyes for a minute, and let's do an experiment. If you've had any concerns or any worries that pop to your mind here during, well, we do this. I want you to wrap it up like a little wad of paper or a little baseball. And when I say do it, I want to say in the name of Jesus, I cast it over on the Lord. Now, you're going to experience something when you do that. Now, you might think, well, I don't have anything I'm really worried about. Of course not. I don't have anything I'm really concerned about. No, most of us don't. But there are some things. So let's do this in faith, okay? Say, Lord, any of my cares, anxieties, or worries, I wrap them all up in a ball. And, Lord, I'm going to cast them over on you. In Jesus' name, and I want you to put yourself tossing it over on. Say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, how many felt a release? Even though you might not be worrying about a thing. And this is my last point. And, or overly careful about a thing, because I know you don't. There are still little things that get in there. So it's always nice after you vacuum to dump the bag. Don't wait till it's full. Don't wait till this full. At night, you go to bed. Lord, I, I plead the blood of Jesus over on my mind and my body. I ask you to cleanse me of anything I might overlook today. And Lord, I'll go to sleep and wake up refreshed in you. In Jesus' name, I just thank you, Lord. And go to sleep like that. See, it becomes a lock. And Satan can't get into your mind. See, he attacks about 2.30 in the morning when you're subconsciously asleep. You get one of those whacked out dreams. Cut it out. And then when you wake up in the morning, you don't even have to get out of bed. Just say, Father, good morning. I know you were awake and you were loving on me when I was sleeping. Yeah. And just imagine yourself writing a little love letter to him. Yeah. And Lord, I just want, and you might get weepy, you might start crying. But Lord, I just want to thank you for greeting me into your day. Yeah. While I was asleep, resting in you, you were busy protecting me and caring for me. See, just that little greeting with God in the morning, he starts sh shutting down your flesh. He starts amplifying your spirit. Your spirit starts, you'll actually feel your spirit charge up. I'm trying to describe it for you. And then he soaks your mind. He rubs it down. So your mind begins quiet, quiets and becomes at ease. And if you're not careful, you'll fall right off back to sleep again. Because he's taken all of that right off of you. But you have to give it to him. You have to say, Lord, I take that and I cast it over on you. Why? Did you think Jesus into your heart? No, you spoke him in there. So when you cast out a care, you speak it out. You say, Lord, that care, you don't have to list it. Every little bit of care, I don't even know I'm worried about. I bind it all up and I cast it out. 
and just begin to get all happy with God. And you'll find out that those little things are just like salve. How many's ever had, you know, maybe a callus on your foot and you rubbed them some nice cream or lotion on there and after a few days of application, that thing just kind of softened up. Come on, we know that. Well, that's the application of God softens us, readies us that we can't do ourselves. You see, Satan's very tricky. Well, you better get in the Word because if you don't get in the Word, God will never be able. No, no. Get in the Word because you want to and just have a good time. Yes. Don't worry about how much or how little. See, that's what the Gentiles think about. You just get in and say, God, I just want to enjoy you. So let's have fun, God. And just relax and start talking to him from your heart. Man, he'll start soaking you. You probably have one of the best days you ever had. I had a guy one time, we did that. Just, we took five minutes out before we got, you know Brad. And we, we went out on his route. He was making sandwiches for all these businesses out on his route. He never had a perfect day before. When him and I prayed, God gave us a perfect day. Amen. Three people got saved. I, I can't remember, two or three, whatever. At least got saved. Everything was just coming together. Click, 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 pop, 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 pop. That's when you bring God's favor in, when you bring that in. But you have to ask yes. every time. It doesn't happen automatically because you, are, you have a resistant one in the atmosphere you breathe. His job is to resist God. So you keep asking God to get involved. You're not getting saved again and again. No, you're getting re-soaked. Re-soaked again. Getting re-soaked. Getting re-soaked. You're putting the lip balm on your lip one more time because they're getting dry again. You understand? So that's what we do. Did you get something out of that tonight? Sorry I kept, it, kept you over.